until AI shows up. And it's both daunting because it's unwinding our thinking about intelligence applications, how software works, but it's also getting embedded in things so bloody fast that five years from now, nobody, nobody will remember it wasn't here. Maybe let's start with product mix. Product um, mix. Product mix. Um, you're selling chips, you're selling boards, you're selling systems, you're going to make chiplets, you're licensing your IP, and you also have a cloud offering. Um, why That's it, true. Why does it make sense to go to market in so many forms? Yeah, so, so here's the funny thing. So we're a design company. So we're designing AI uh, IP and, and CPU IP. Right? And then we talk to customers and say, how do you want to buy it? And they're all over the map, right, first of all. So when we started, we said, we have a chip. We can put it on board. We can put it in the system. That was pretty easy. And then AI startups said something like, well, we don't really buy computers anymore. Everything's on the cloud. Or somebody said, I want to try it before I buy it. So we built a cloud. And we thought doing that would give us the experience of what's it like to take this computer and install it and build it. Yeah. And it turned out that was really hard. And we also had offers from other people that said, we'll build a cloud for you. But we thought we would never learn anything. And so that was part of a learning process, which was, let's say, painful, but, but useful. Okay. The IP came from, we talked to customers, and they said, we like what you're doing, but we want to make our own chip. Yeah. Right. And so they said, can we license the IP? And then the surprising thing to me, on RISC-V especially, was, like, I believe open source wins. Yes. Right. Once people switched to Linux, nobody went back to NT. Nobody went back to OS 360, right? It's a one-way street. Um, I think RISC-V over time is going to win. And that's because it's a, it's a technology you can own. Yeah. Right? You don't have to license it. You don't get licensing surprises. Like you were licensing it, and all of a sudden the license fee went up. Yeah, you yeah. can keep doing something you want. Um, it was a pleasant surprise that people said, that CPU looks really good. Could we license it? And then we found that some people, they were not sure about the AI, but they liked uh, the CPU. And then they came back and said, could we license the IP? Mm -hmm. And I thought, sure, like, like we'll, we'll see what happens. Okay. Now, to be honest, we're early in our business. Yes. Right? We're not selling anything. Well, we're selling IP. We sold some hardware. We have people onboarded on our cloud, but we're still small. We're working out a lot of technology issues. and. Um, as a technologist, I'm really interested in engagement with smart people. Sure. So somebody really smart says, I want open source access to your hardware so I can program it the way I want. Why would I say no to that? So we're in, let's say, business exploration mode. Mm -hmm. And then we've had some surprises, let's say. Yes, OK. OK. Um, how do you avoid overlap? Or how do you avoid competing with customers and so on with so many different offerings? Um, well, in the short run, it doesn't matter. We're too small. The okay. business is so big. Who cares? Yeah. Right? Um, on RISC-V and AI, there's a network effect thing. So there's a bunch of RISC-V companies, mm -hmm. you know, Rebo, Sci-5, Antana, Star-5. There's a few more. Right? Collectively, they're small compared to Intel architecture or ARM. There's so much business to do. Yeah. We're not competing with each other. Or at some level, we'd be crazy to go compete for the one RISC five socket when there's ten thousand ARM and x eighty six sockets. So we'll see what happens. Um, when you're building network effect, yeah, there's some competition, but the more people participating, the bigger the network. So there's usually a, a growth phase where competition essentially doesn't matter. There'll be some consolidation phase will matter a lot, but that. That's after we're already unbelievably successful. So I'm not, I'm not worried about that problem yet. Okay. Um, so you've licensed your accelerator core, the 10.6 core, to LG. I'm yes, told did. they are putting it in TVs. Mm -hmm. um, what were they looking for that they couldn't get from other uh, IP providers? There were a few around. And LG yeah. even had its own AI IP thing that they spun out. Like, yes. What? Yeah. So, so first, they're a great technology company. So I have one of their TVs. So when I met them, so we, we kind of nerded out on the technology goes into the display, into they have their own processing. Mm -hmm. It turns out they have quite a strong engineering team. They know how to make chips. 
They have an IPU portfolio. So they, they, they're technical guys who know what they're doing. So that was fun. Um, what they wanted was, and we've talked to lots of people about this, they want IP that's programmable, that they can own, they can modify, they can hit their needs. And what happened early on is a whole bunch of companies provided, let's say, AI inference IP, which is 8-bit integer, fairly narrow, fairly hard to program. And then over time, in the, the, literally just the last two years, there's been five pivots. Yes. Is it, is it inferencer language? Is it inferencer training? Is it a big model or a small model? Is it generative or not? And everybody who targeted an IP, the next model didn't work, right? So one of our premises you know, from the founding was AI is going to evolve a lot. The differentiation between inference and training, language, and image are going to be blurry. They're going to move back and forth. You know, one of my favorite models is like stable diffusion. It's got a language model, it's got an image model, it's got the back pass of, part of the back pass of training pipeline. It's generative, it has a unit. It looks like the kitchen sink. Like which IP does that run on? Yeah, yeah. It's pretty yeah. general. Yeah. So we, we talked to them about it. Like, to be honest, we didn't like pitch them like you need to buy this or something. They were looking around and they, they, they said, we'd like to partner with you guys. Awesome. So that was that was good. Okay. And partnering with smart engineers who build their own stuff and know what they're doing, you learn so much. Yeah. Like that's the. Yeah. So that was the for us that was the opportunity. Yeah. Like, really, we could put technology in your products and then work with you guys. That's that's super fun. Sure. So the engagement was very positive. Um, do you have any plans to uh, make an edge chip? or to make uh, more like embedded edge chips? I know you're kind of going into that market with IP at the moment. Yeah, so our initial product, you know, is going to price between $1,000 and $2,000 for a card. So it depends on what you mean by edge and so what, the, pro vehicle, yes, you know, what the price point is, watch, right? No, right? Yes, exactly. So, and people have a really broad range. Now, we've been asked to hit some interesting price points. So a $500 sellable card is an add-on you can put in like any server really yeah. easily. Yeah. Like 500, is a, there's a big price break. Yeah. I talked to guys building power supplies. Okay. They would love a $30 chip that they could put in server power supplies, right? Why? Well, it turns out the control system for that is complicated. And if the control system gets to a certain point, an AI model is actually a better cost-effective solution. Okay. And their problem was they can't find the IP that is programmable the way they do their math, which is surprising. That is surprising. So, but AI is going to pop up all over the place for all different reasons. Yeah. And then the question is, what do we do about it? And then one reason to license our AI IP is there's a couple of chip companies who are really good at making embedded controllers, you know, video, what they call video edge servers. And what they really need is either an IP or a chiplet for their next thing. So we're working on it. Okay. And like how that plays out, you know, it's hard to tell. Like, yeah. Yeah. But yeah, the inbound on that's really interesting. Um, but it goes back to the, let's say, you, you asked like, why are you being so open? Well, one is open means that people can come talk to us and say, could we do this or that? And could go, yeah, sure. Yeah as opposed to you buy from one of the big companies and they say, here's, the ter here's your allocation, here's the terms, here's the price, and the software is proprietary, possibly encrypted, and comes with, let's say, less support. Yeah. And that's a problem for people. Yeah. So that's, the, that's kind of the journey people are on. I'll give you an example. Okay. So here's, years ago, I was at a startup and we used NT for servers. Um, and we had some CAD tools that wanted to run on NT, and there was a bug with the printer. So we reported the bug, and a year later, we got an update from Microsoft that did not fix the bug. Okay. It was well known. I don't know why. It was a printer driver. Like, it wasn't a real big problem. Yeah. Probably takes somebody eight seconds to fix it. Didn't get fixed. We switched to Linux. We had a problem with a different piece of peripheral, but similar thing. And somebody just, you know, searched and talked to their buddies and we got a patch in a half an hour and fixed it. Okay. 
Yeah. So the, the, the iteration rate, uh, we waited a year and they didn't fix it to, we found a patch and we fixed it. Like the genius of open source is, you know, while it's a little bumpy, you can fix it, the softwares. You know, when I was at Tesla, we built our own AI software stack. We had total visibility to the whole thing. We did some optimizations that we could not do with somebody else's stuff. Yeah. So one reason for open source is you can own it. The other yeah. is you can change it. The other is you can actually look in the details. So Tensor, we're going to open source our software stack for AI. Now it turns out we wanted to do that last year, but we weren't ready. Okay. Our software stack was too messy, okay. and it needs it needs to be partitioned the right way. We got some, yep. let's say, friends in the business who knew open source software and said, "Don't open source that. Fix it." And, uh, fix it first. And and, uh, and then that caused us to do some thinking about how we factored the software, and it's it's mm -hmm. good, mm -hmm. which is another charm of open source software. It's not a secret mess. Yeah. Like, you know, <laughs> yeah. you know yeah. like everybody knows how Linux works. Yeah. You can, you can go read it. Yeah. Right? GCC, LLVM, all the open source software stacks are available. And you can look at them. And some are great and some are, you know, dodge, you know you, and you can make your own calls. And then somebody might call you up and say, this is a bloody mess and here's what you should fix. Yeah. And uh, I think that's really cool. So, yeah. So we, we aspire to be a company that open source software successfully yeah. and that people look at it and, and don't think it's crazy and uh, possibly give us feedback. It's, but hard, it's hard to do though, right? You have yeah. to maintain it, you have to work on it. It's a lot yeah. of work. Well, right? well, we're working on it. It's our yeah. living. Yeah. Like we're committed to it. Okay. But the charm is the customers can look at it and we actually have a few customers onboarded who are looking at our software stack. One sent us a detailed five page document of questions and one, one of my guys said, they know more about our software than I did. Well, wow. yeah, it was cool. Okay. Like, it was great. So we're answering all the questions. And, you know, let's say we're fixing a few things. Okay. It's great. Yeah, it's, yeah that's okay. how that goes. Um, I think we covered this a little already, but with such a strong, big competitor, single competitor for the data center, for HPC, mm -hmm. um, how does an AI chip company compete with NVIDIA? Hey, this, this, this story has played out how many times? Yeah, so many times. Yeah, um, IBM, nobody went. Yeah. Nobody got fired for buying IBM. Nobody got fired for buying Sun. Nobody, hey, hey, that's how the world works. Yeah. People get big and confident, let's say, and successful. And they work on the stuff that big companies work on, which is margins, mm -hmm. you know, profitability, market cap. How's that? Is that a customer? Right. And, and then how do you own it? And then what happens when the world changes and stuff? Yeah. So I, I think over the next couple of years, and it's, it's interesting because AI has been an amazingly open field. Okay. In the sense that a lot of the primary research is published. Yeah. Um, people often replicate multiple models. Right? Somebody publishes it, somebody replicates it, somebody improves it. Stable diffusion improved some incredible numbers of times in the last year. They published it and then people started tweaking it and iterating and adding stuff to it. So it's interesting that such an open, let's say, in, you know, cowboy land kind of software stack is dominated by a few big players, right? But then the other side of it is the cost and expense to build the truly big, great models is really high. Yes. Right. And then, and you know, and some people are happy about that because that creates a moat. Yeah. Right. And then some people think, well, what what will the world be like if only three companies can afford to build AI? Right. Bad. Well, you go figure. You know, yeah. I, um, I I think that creates an opportunity for small companies because people say. I would like to build my own computer. I would like to build it the way I want. I would like to see it. That, that creates an opportunity for us. And now how that plays out, we'll see. Yeah, okay. Right? Okay. Um, so here's an interesting thing. So Intel was the original open source architecture. Yeah. Yeah, you remember. They yeah, had seven yeah. sub-licenses. Yeah, yeah. The reason 
the 8086 beat the Z80 and the 6502 and the 6800 and the 68000 is there was multiple players. Mm -hmm. Now, Intel did an especially good job in the combination of foundry and architecture for years was a winner. And in some sense, having AMD as a, a, a real competitor has kept them honest in a way that, yes. you know, yeah. like some proprietary things without the competitive pressure, you know, lose it. So, so no, I think the open source world is, is important. And we've seen that dynamic play out. Like yes. there was an explosion of mini computer companies. Yes. Right? Yeah. And then when they got successful, they started ignoring the market. And then there was workstation companies. And then the PC world, you know, basically decimated the, the old computer world. And so these changes have happened multiple times. And, and they will continue to happen. At the top of a peak, everybody thinks, why would it change? Yeah. I don't know. History. That's what books are for. Okay, okay. You know, um, 100 years of technology, you know, evolution. Geez, it's amazing. Since you're talking about x86 mm -hmm. there and the, the mm -hmm. ecosystem and mm -hmm. the competition, we need that for RISC-V now, right? Uh, it, it, it's in your interest for yeah, other yeah, data center chip yeah. companies to make RISC-V designs because it kind of builds momentum then, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah so uh, my belief is that over the next five to 10 years, RISC-V will take over all the data centers. I think that's true. Even supercomputers? Yeah. Oh, especially supercomputers. Just customizable. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. We've talked to multiple supercomputer guys, and they're like, we're the world's experts on vectorizing compiler, vector floating point performance, yeah. local memory. Yeah. And then they go to the big vendors, and they say, I want these changes. And the vendors all sensibly say no. Right? OK. So, but they're actually the experts. Like, they know what they want. Right, so yeah, so supercomputing could happen faster. Now the, the surprising thing about RISC-V is how fast the software ecosystem is moving. Okay. And there's two reasons for that. One is, I explained this to some friends at AMD and they were, they were uh, somewhat pained about this, right? The data center ran on Intel, right? A lot of that was open source Linux, but a lot of it's proprietary system management software. Mm -hmm. So when AMD showed up with a pretty good product, it didn't work. Because AMD didn't have access to all Intel's proprietary system management code. People actually had to write it. And a lot of it got written in open source in C. Okay. So when they ported the ARM, okay. you'd think, well, Intel to AMD is easy, right? And, and AMD to ARM is harder. No, it's easier. C programs, compilers, compilers work. Okay. The problem wasn't whether it was x86 or ARM underneath. The problem was there was proprietary software or not. Okay. They were worried about the wrong thing. Now, ARM has its own teething pains to become a server platform. Yeah. So we started a joint venture with a company in India called Bodhi, mm -hmm. who's going to build server products. And they have really great software guys there. And they brought up, so there's an emulator called QMU. There's an extension for RISC-V. There's a virtualization software stack, which they ran. And then they put Linux on top of that and ran multiple applications. So we've actually, in six, less than six months, brought up a server software stack on a RISC-V emulator. Yeah. I was amazed. I thought that was going to take a year. I thought they were going to, you know. And then Google, of all people, is porting Android to RISC-V. A couple other big companies have internal RISC-V developments. Yeah. Revos has a great software team. Yeah. Sci-Fi has been pushing this for years. Yeah, yeah. Ventana's yeah. a good company. Yeah. They got some really good engineers. Some of those guys are my friends. Yeah. And so I, I actually think the RISC-V change is going to accelerate. And people came to us and said, we like your offering, but what about software? Well, Olaf Johansson just joined us. Yes. He worked with me at Tesla, Apple, PASME. He's great. And he knows everybody. And he knows what he's doing. Yeah. yeah. So, and then the, the charm of it is all that software is open source. We're contributing, other people are contributing. The people who are into it talk to each other. Yeah. They say, you do this, I'll do that, which lowers my development costs. So, yeah, it's, it's an interesting phenomenon. So, yeah. Um, 
So you ask, like, don't we need a bunch of big data centers? Yeah. You know, the big data centers aren't going to be the ones that flip first. Yeah. All right. So I, I, I was one of the offers of the hypertransport spec, x86-64, two-p servers. And when I talked to all the server guys when we were writing that, the big servers, Intel, Dell, HP, they're interested, but servers have a backplane. Didn't you know that? The CPU card, memory card, IO card, network card, there's a backplane, it's a four piece server, and then we're making a server, it goes on a board, there's no backplane, right? They hated it, right? And then when the 2P server started to be a thing, the original boxes had backplanes in them. There's a big effort to make a backplane because servers, as we know, have backplanes. Yeah. Right now, if you go look at it, there's a rack of one, two, four U boxes in the back is just ethernet cables. Yeah. The backplane had the ethernet cables in them. Oh, okay. I'm not kidding. <laughs> okay. Right, it took a while. And you know who you know, adopted like, stuff like that was startups. Like Google's an early adopter of Optron. Mm -hmm. And they did it the way I thought they would do it, which is they had an ATX board on a foam pad on a kitchen shelf in their data center. I was there. Right? And they had a lot of them. Yeah. And they liked the 2P because they saved them a nick. They bought one less network card. I asked them, why did you use it? They go, oh, we saved a nick. Really? Yeah, yeah, the Intel thing, it's only one socket, and this is two sockets. Yeah, so right. Intel, I have one NIC per processor, and here I have one NIC per two processors. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you never know how things are going to go. No, you're right. And now you go into data centers, 2P servers everywhere, and you'd think, you know, servers were born that way. No, no. The server guys hated that. Wrecked their business. I talked to all of them. I said, wouldn't it be cool to really lower the cost of servers? And they're like, no, we don't want to lower cost of servers. Well, they wanted to make more money. Mm, okay. You sell a million dollar server with 50% gross margin, and here's a server for 2,000 bucks that makes 50% gross margin on one is 500,000, and the other is 2,000. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's done that out now. Yeah. Um, what do you think about hyperscalers efforts to make their own chips and can you give us some insight into what their make versus buy decisions are like i don't know anything about their make buy decisions yeah i don't I, either i've talked, I've talked to a lot of them so hyperscalers you know their their public objectives they drive tco yeah right um, they buy in volume so let's say they have pretty high leverage on the mm -hmm. suppliers and which I'm sure they use, but there's a margin stack problem, yeah. right? So TSMC makes wafers, AMD makes chips, you know, Dell makes a computer, yeah. somebody buys it, yeah. everybody has a margin stack. So, so if a hyperscaler can say, I'm gonna buy a wafer from TSMC. Now TSMC, by the way, buys equipment for ASML, applied materials, and a bunch yes. of places. So like margin stack is part of life, Yes. Yeah. right? So, there's a piece which is you cut out some margin stacking. Apple famously does this. Okay. They make their own chips, they buy wafers. Yep. Somebody else buys a chip from Qualcomm, right? So then the question is, does the person you buy it at enough value to compensate for the margin and compensate? So if you're a low volume person, you can't afford to make your own chip. You buy a Qualcomm chip if yes. you're big. Now the other thing is, like here's the Steve Jobs line is, you can't make the best product if you don't have the best technology. Mm -hmm. And Steve believed he knew how to build the best technology, so he always wanted to do stuff himself when possible. So that, that's a fact. And then there's some optimizations you can make. I'm sure Google and Microsoft and these companies have unbelievable amounts of data about what, what they really need. Yes. Okay. Right? Whereas when people sell products, they tend to sell what they want to sell. Yes. And I've talked to some of them about this. Okay. And, and I think Graviton's a good example that they optimize for their workload. So they, they probably save some money because they buy wafers. Yeah. They probably save some money because it's more optimized for their workload. Yeah. Now the fun part is what happens in a world where 20, 30, 40 people are making their own servers? Yeah. Right, the, the, let's say the possibility of innovation goes up. 
In a, world, in a unipolar world, you do your next thing, and you pay attention to some customers and ignore the rest. In a, in a duopoly, typically one follows the other. Right. When there's 50 people, the, let's say the opportunity for chaos and randomness goes way up, and then we'll see what happens. Yeah. Yeah. And that frequently happens. Like there was a network processing revolution, there's 50 companies, there's GPU revolution. Whenever there's a pivot, there's, there's 50 or 100 AI hardware startups, there's probably 500 AI software startups. Yeah. So when you see technology inflection points, you'll see more people doing it. Yes. So ARM started a, like say, ARM server ball rolling and I, I'd say before they seriously capitalized it on it, Risk Five showed up, yeah. which is way more amenable to, let's say, letting chaos reign. Yeah. So we'll see what happens. You're not worried about chaos. Oh no, no, I'm a chaos fan, obviously. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, Andy Grove has the line: "Let chaos reign, then reign chaos in." Of all people, okay. Andy Grove, the guy okay. who invented the company who ran like a machine, TikTok. Yeah, yeah. But that's okay. not what he, you know, he was a real engineer. Yeah. Like, you read his stuff. He's, a, he's a, a creative genius who knows how to go from the world of chaos to the world of execution. So managers confuse this kind of stuff. They go, look at, look at Intel. They were just, you know, tick tock, unbelievably disciplined and everything. Yeah, not way back in the fab. Not way in the design side, they're cowboys. But they turned great ideas in design into highly refined product, and and that's an intellectual yeah, it's like process. About, that's really hard. Allowing innovation in the first step. Yeah, yeah, you have to. Because yeah. everybody who, well, people use innovation to get to wherever they are, and then the question is, can you maintain innovation despite your success? Yes. <laughs> Okay. All right, that's, that's the intellectual challenge. Yeah. Like refining something that's great for a while, that works for a while, lots of companies do it. And then the world changes and they find out nobody wants their product. Yeah. How many ro rotary phone experts do you know? Right. There used to be a lot. Yeah? Sure, of course, they were great. Rotary phones, man, the spring tension, yeah, 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 the yeah, feel. Yeah. yeah, yeah. The smoothness of the bearing, the sound. You don't think that's engineering? There's a thousand people who worked their asses off to build that technology. I'm not kidding. I'm um, sad for the rotary phone <laughs> engineers. Going back to something you said on Hey, I worked on faxes. <laughs> I'm a fax expert. I could, I could do a black diagram and tell you how to build a high speed instruction decoder with a variable instruction. Mix. Going back to something you said about hyperscalers, um, how they can optimize a little more for, they know more about their workloads and they can optimize more mm -hmm. for it. Right now, obviously, LLMs mm -hmm. taking off hugely. Do you think there's a play for more specialized hardware towards LLMs? Absolutely. Yeah? Yeah. And by the way, the hyperscalers are relatively unlikely to find it. OK. Well, they're very successful. That's why they call them hyperscalers. Yes. Right. So. So they probably have lots of efforts to do random things. And we'll see what happens. I'm, I'm curious always. Um, yeah, me too. Um, but they're highly likely to double down on success. And the path to bringing in technology and optimizing it for cost is not quite the same as let chaos reign and do more experiments. Mm. So we'll see what happens. Yeah. Okay. Um, but yeah, there's. Well, when hasn't there been an opportunity to make things completely different? Like every, everywhere you look, people look at some established technology and think that could never be better. You know, I'm sure the guys who built, you know, the airplane engines in World War II, they were unbelievably good. 100% mm -hmm. gone. Jet engines are unbelievably good. Yeah. 20 years from now, they'll all be electric motors. And they'll, think, they'll look at jet engines and go, what the hell were they thinking? They're unbelievably complicated. Yeah. The metallurgy, Moving the refinement, the, oh, yeah. Jesus. Yeah. Like turbines are just, they're, they're great. They're super hard. Yeah. And I feel, feel the same way about fabs. You go in a fab and you look at it, it's unbelievably refined and completely crazy. Sure. So, yeah. It won't look this way in 20 years. 
Um, what do you think of, so there's a, a school of thought that says if you can specialize more than NVIDIA does, you can compete better with what NVIDIA is doing. Um, what do you think of inference only plays for the data center? Is there a market for that? Yeah, hard fail. Yeah, you don't. Yeah, I, no. I doubt it. The problem is the models are changing too much. Yeah, okay. Like what's a, what's a generative model? Is it inference or training? It's like, kind of uh, yeah, yeah. What's closing a, the gap a little yeah, bit. Yeah, what's a stable diffusion model? Is it language yeah. or image? What's, yeah. what's, what's going on? Like, yeah. So these are computer platforms, right? So you don't beat incumbents with billions of dollars in research and tens of thousands of person years of experience by focusing. NVIDIA is focused on everything that they do. They're a great company. Yeah. You, you have to do something different, or you find a different business model or a different market, or there's, you're open to something that it's too small for them. Here's a great quote. So Alan Eustace uh, was a researcher at Digital Western Research Lab, so I, I knew him years ago, and he went on to be, for a while, um, VP of Engineering at Google, mm -hmm. which, which is pretty wild. It's quite the position, because when I knew him, he was let's say an out of the box kind of guy. Okay. And at some point he uh, jumped out of an airplane or a rocket or something and did the highest parachute jump ever. What? Yeah, go, go Google it. He's, okay. he's, he's, Alan's a great guy. But he, he said he, was, he went to, uh, the, they got the researchers together with CTO of digital and, and the CTO asked him, just, just only focus on $100 million businesses or bigger. Wow. So you mean you just passed on Google, Facebook, Amazon. How does that work? Yeah. How do you, how do you pick? Yeah. The problem with the big company is they're making billions of dollars on this and billions on this and billions on that. Somebody says, I have this great idea. How much are you going to make next year? Oh, 100,000? Like it's, it's hard for them to do that. Yeah. So, but that's a normal business process. And then great companies see the pivots happen. Like Jensen called the AI pivot years before it yeah. was real. Yeah. Like that's really good. Yeah. Right, so, but they worked really hard to get into mobile and a couple other businesses, which is not, you know, mm. trying to get into somebody's business where they're already experts. Yeah. By doing what they did. So AI worked for NVIDIA because that was a new market. Nobody was doing it. Yes. Mobile, that was owned by somebody. Wireless radios, that was owned yeah. by somebody. Yeah. So, so you can kind of, you can kind of, well, in retrospect, go, I know why that worked and that didn't work, but who knows. Um, for computing at scale, uh, because I'm studying AI chips for my hmm. job, I tend to think of it as a chip level problem, but as you scale up or scale out, it, is it more of a system level problem or it's a combination of both? And how does that change as you build bigger and bigger computers? It's a programming problem. It's a programming problem. Yeah, yeah. So we know how to make, like Roger Kadori is a friend of mine. He said when he got to Intel, he realized there was a lot of MOLAD units in there. You know, what AI multiply, add, Tensor modification, yeah. vector operation, ReLU, softmax, there's not that many operations. Right? So you, you kind of look at it and you think, well, that doesn't look hard. Hence, the 50 to 100 AI startups run by hardware guys mm -hmm. who all think <laughs> that doesn't look that hard. We can make a faster multiplier. Sure, yeah. Yeah, so. And then if you look at a big data center, like there's boxes and then there, there's chips and out of the back are cables and then there's networking. You know, we're really good at networking. Yeah. So the fundamentals of computing are, you know, memory computing and I.O. We're, all, we're good at those. And then when a new application comes along, you say, hey, there's a lot of these operations. Let's make engines to do that. The unsolved problem of computation is parallel computing. Right. So when I was a digital. So I met the parallelizing compiler team in 1983. So we were building a dual processor of X, and they had a one-year project to parallelize the compiler automatically. So you'd write a Fortran program, yeah. it would run on both processors, yeah. get 90% utilization. Yeah. And that project is not finished yet. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it's like 40 years. <laughs> it's a, it's yeah. 40 years. 
And it's, it's interesting that it's not finished. And it's interesting how we do use big parallel data centers. Mm -hmm. Like Google was brilliant because on the one hand, they had a million users. Mm -hmm. They need a million computers. But mm -hmm. they actually did something wild, which is your search requests went to 1,000 computers and they sharded the database and they did some pretty clever things. So you had the experience of a very fast computer. Mm -hmm. It wasn't a million people on a million computers. It was a million people on 10,000 computers at a time, so you got something really fast and they built software infrastructure to solve it. So the AI scale problem, the companies that train big models have hundreds of people managing all kinds of layers of software. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And today you can buy a 6428 CPU server. There's no software stack where you write a C program and it runs all of them. The operating system knows about all 128 cores. It's scheduling threads on all of them. It's amazing. And it only exists because we started with one, then we went to two, and three, four, mostly powers. So we'll see what happens. Yeah. Like, this is a wild software problem. Software. Which is one of the problems I'm interested in. Yeah. Which is, how do you write code that looks like, you know, the code that humans think about, and then runs in parallel like the computers want to be built? Yeah. Like, if we could just make one really big, fat computer that ran things really fast, we would. Yeah. The software guys would be happy. <laughs> And, and there's a deep reason for that. Like, you ever watched your thinking? You think in linear narrative, right? I did this, and then I did this, and yeah. then I thought about that, and then I said that, and then he said that, and that's, that's linear, isn't yeah. it? You have 10 billion neurons randomly fired and wiggled around to generate a linear narrative. That's not the weirdest thing that's ever happened. I don't know what, I mean, it's just so crazy. So then we build AI computers where we take our linear narrative, I want to do this and this and this, and run it on thousands of parallel computers. Damn it. Oh, I'm only on, still only on page one. <laughs> you're, you're not a very good interviewer. <laughs> I don't want to cut you off. That's my problem. Uh, no, um, well, okay. Keep going. Speaking of how the brain works, um, mm. I wanted to ask, uh, do you think there's value in trying to directly copy how the brain works in silicon, spiking neural networks and so on? What do you think about that area? I doubt the spiky thing is right. You don't think so? Um, I suspect, though, that the way we think and the way neural networks are more similar mm -hmm. than we thought. Okay. Like when you first make, started making like, you know, ResNet model kind of things, and you look at these convolutions and these blocks, and you think, eh, it doesn't look anything like neurons. But then you start looking at uh, layers of computation, like this is an all-to-all -all computation, and then this is a, let's say, sense the results of that, mm -hmm. and then another computation. Mm -hmm. And each layer of computation is, let's say, a, success, a successive abstraction. That actually seems fairly interesting in terms of how we actually think. And then when we think, we kind of go through that loop over and over, which feels sort of like generative. So your mind has a workspace, mm -hmm. and then you have many, let's say, sub-neural networks that look at the workspace and iterate and then update the workspace. Yeah. And we're, we're kind of building that. Now, how deep the analogy is, I don't know. Yeah. Okay. But it's, it's, it's uh, provocative. But spiking or not, you know, like I know how transistors work. I know how neurons fire. I know how the sodium ion goes across the membrane. Yeah. I, I don't, I mean, I don't that, that's, that's what we would call, uh, so we, we build computers in terms of layers. Yeah. Right, you know, at the bottom there's atoms and there's quantum physics and then there's band gaps and then there's transistor devices and AND gates and then logic functions. And, you know, I can describe the stack from pretty much an atom up to an operating system. And then, you know, you could say, well, I can run an operating system on lots of kinds of transistors. You don't look at the transistor and go, well, that's going to define how Linux works. It's four abstractions or eight abstractions away. Yeah. So spiking or not, yeah, that looks like a switch. It's a switch of a certain type. But it's, yeah. It's and to a computer architect, you know, there's, there's encoding methods. We encode things with one and zeros. We encode them with run length encoding. We encode them PAM2, PAM4. You know, there's lots of encoding methods. So.
it's not that, it's not likely that's that interesting, but maybe. Maybe. Yeah. Um, public perception of AI has changed a lot in the last mm. few months with ChatGPT, right? Yeah. Um, is there a danger that we're, well, that the public is kind of falsely ascribing intelligence to something that is just good at convincing language? Oh. Do you think that's dangerous? Oh. No, I thought the opposite was true. Okay. We f falsely think that our intelligence is special. Really? Okay. Yeah, so a friend of mine said, um, so they used to think, here's, here's the funny thing, you know, to, to, to win at chess, we'll have to make a really intelligent system. And then they made a computer that won at chess, and they go, oh, that's not real intelligence. But to win it and go, that's intelligent. Now it can do that. And now it can do that, that's not intelligence. Oh, to recognize an image, that's an, no, of course not. To chat, talk back due to a response, that'll be intelligent. Passing the Turing test, you can talk to chat GPT all day. Yeah. Makes mistakes and gets random, but who doesn't? But that's not intelligence. All right, so we're gonna, we're gonna get all the way through this while declaring everything's not intelligence yeah. without actually looking in the mirror and going, well, what the hell are we doing? Like, I think uh, the definition of intelligence is, is the problem. Like, we're goal-directed, and we're problem solvers, and yeah. we're future imaginers, and we're yeah. scenario capable, and we can game things, and we can come up with alternatives, we can judge them, we can recognize things. And we put that together in some interesting loop, and then we have a narrative in our head about who we are and why we do it. Mm -hmm. The narrative, by the way, is, is, uh, is runs in arrears. You, you make your decisions before you think about them. The narrative is post hoc rationalization. That's useful for future planning, but it's not, like there's lots of papers on this. Yeah. Okay. Like do we have free will in the world of, you know, our thoughts are literally okay. half a second behind our, our thinking. Yeah, so, yeah, but so the, anyway, I, I, I'm not sure that was your question. Your question is probably something like, this AI hype cycle has been unbelievable. It Positive, been. negative, yeah. Yeah. exciting, scary, useful. Yeah, it's, it's, it's daunting. It does, you know, AI does stuff that, you know, the internet, mobile revolution, PC revolution, they opened up doors, made things possible, made things, you know, generic. I have a, I have a trillion dollars worth of technology with a crack in the glass <laughs> because I worked at Apple and I think Steve would be unhappy that they would make a phone that would crack if you dropped it on the floor. That seems stupid. Like, why would you make that phone? So I haven't fixed it because it reminds me that humans are imperfect because, like, why would you carry around a trillion dollars worth of technology? But it didn't cost a trillion, it only cost a thousand bucks. And somehow with a thousand bucks, they couldn't find it in their hearts to make glass that didn't crack. Right, so, the, so we're, we're funny creatures. Yeah. So PCs are everywhere, we just assume them. TVs are super great, we just assume it. You know, the 50s, everybody was an expert on getting vertical hold at, and yeah. shaping the antenna. Yeah. You know, nobody even knows about that anymore. Yeah. So AI shows up and it's both daunting because it's unwinding our thinking about intelligence applications, how software works, but it's also getting embedded in things so bloody fast that five years from now, nobody, nobody will remember it wasn't here. Can and then AI what happens? Can innovate today, though? It can sure. write code. But yeah, yeah, it's happening really fast. Yeah. Well, we think innovation is some magical thing. I had this idea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I think so. Oh, you do? Yeah. Oh, that's great for you. <laughs> that's cute, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, so what you, you, don't have, you don't have conscious awareness of how many levels of abstraction are in your thinking, right? And then the other thing is we, we essentially, we have lots of stuff we know and then we create some randomness and we play that randomness back through something that makes, like we t the, the abstractions turn unknown and data into something that seems known. Right? And then we learn when we can't make something known out of it. Mm -hmm. And we're very good at, let's say, thinking by randomizing some of our thinking and then making something out of it. Yeah. And that happens 
at lower, uh, you know, higher levels or deeper levels of abstraction than you're aware of. Yeah. So that aha moment isn't like a message from the universe. That's a message from your abstraction layers that you have no conscious awareness of. Which machines can do. Well, we can build machines with more levels of abstraction than yeah. humans. Yeah. Like, like humans, you know, the famous, you can remember seven digits. Yeah. You know how many machine can remember? Yeah. As many as you want. Yeah. It's a really wild phenomena. So yeah, we'll see what happens. We'll see what happens. So Sam Altman has been in uh, the US Senate yesterday. Who? Sam Who? Altman? Ah, Sam, yeah. Yeah, uh, mm -hmm. he's been in the US Senate talking about, oh, it should be regulated. Uh, where, mm -hmm. What's your stance on regulation for AI? Yeah, I don't know. Like, what are they going to regulate? Yeah. Computers? Yeah. Programs? Yeah. The thing is, like, the, the, the programs and the modifications of them are easier than people thought. Mm -hmm. So there's, uh, could you regulate the big guys who have 10,000 GPUs? Yeah, you can count how many people have those and, and go regulate them. What, what happens when there's 100 million computers that can run AI programs? Are we going to put spyware in everybody's phone? Yeah. What kind of world is that? Yeah. Yeah. So this is one of those, the, the solution creates a problem way worse than the problem. Mm. Yeah. But do we have to start somewhere? Start where? Yeah. I mean, that's the thing, nobody knows how to start that one. Yeah. Sensibly. Well, you be know. interesting to see what happens, I guess. Yeah, I like Elon's take of it. Like, AI is going to evolve really fast, and the, the, the thing we need to be careful about is make sure we, we make it as honest as possible. Yes. And because people think, well, I'm going to bias this because I know better and I know that. That's been the root of every horrible scenario that's ever happened. That's what history books are for. You should read them, right? an open society with lots of independent experiments where things have a legitimate way to have checks and balances yes and success and not success yeah. and debate yeah. that works pretty good yeah giving somebody authority to quote regulate something that hasn't worked very well yeah and it doesn't work in any industry you know there's all these safety organizations and health and this and that and as best i can tell they turn into bureaucracies and do what bureaucracies do which is serve bureaucracies. Yeah. So, like, I prefer, yeah, I think the world should be open and we should uh, be ready to deal with it. Yeah. So, we'll see what happens. We'll see what happens. Jim, thank you so much. I oh. really enjoyed our conversation. Yeah, that was fun. That was, yeah, fun. was fun. <laughs> I'll come back and speak to him again. Yeah, yeah. I've got, like, more pages of questions, but I'll come back in September. Yeah, cool. That'd yeah. be cool. Yeah, it'll be fun. Thanks very much. For yeah, yeah, yeah. You were, you, you looked, you looked interesting. And delighted. <laughs> it's, it's a pretty funny place. But who knows?